Welcome everybody to Yonkers Voice Central, another episode that's bringing you politics today in Yonkers and elsewhere, but today we're dealing with Yonkers and we are in the offices of State Senator Andrea Stewart-Cousins, who has just been re-elected and we're going to go right to the point. Congratulations. Senator. Thank you so very, very much. Uh, Actually, the election is in November, so I was in a primary contest, which I'm you know, very pleased that I won with over 80% of the vote, but then people must come back in November and vote uh, in the general election. So it's a two-step process, and I also want to make sure that people realize that we are running out of time if they're not registered to vote. They need to register, uh, I think, by October 12th. An important and a very, very important point, folks. Yes, yes, uh, so that you can have a voice in the November elections. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Now, that was the easy part. Now to the, <laughs> to, 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 to the, to the tough part. Uh, early on, not early on, not so long ago, you were denied your chance of becoming the Senate Majority Leader. And that was... Correct me if I'm wrong, that was due to one vote in particular, Simcha Felder. And now that the IDC is, I want to say, null and void, what do you think the chances will be of your being able to achieve that goal? Well, uh, I think, again, it's all happening in November. Uh, the problem, as you've alluded to, was that we had a group of Democrats, uh, referred to as the IDC, independent Democrats, who for the past seven years had really uh, governed with Republicans to the exclusion of the Democrats. And there were times when Democrats had the majority in 2012, for example, in 2016, where we had a numerical majority, but because there were a group of people that were affiliating and aligned with Republicans, we were denied the, the majority. Uh, Simka Felder had always sat, not even in the IDC, he'd always sat with the Republicans. And Simka Felder, uh, as I say, you know, he also ran on the Democratic line. He's a Brooklyn person. He ran on the Democratic line, the Republican line, the conservative line. He runs on all the lines. And he always said, no matter who has the majority, that's who I'm going to be sitting with. So we've always known who Simcoe was. So when the IDC was uh, dismantled in April and they came back, to us, the conversation was whether Simca would also then, instead of being, there's 32 that makes the majority in the Senate. So he was sitting in the Republican conference being their 32nd vote. And we were trying to woo him to our conference to be our 32nd vote. Simca decided he did not want to leave the Republicans and he remained there. So now we are at that moment of truth again in November. Minus Klein? Uh, minus, you know, on, uh, I believe six members of the IDC out of eight uh, were defeated during the primaries. So I have six brand new members. Uh, and in the November election is when we go head to head, you know, so people, and I know your, your audience is, is very astute, but the primaries is, it's, it's when people within the same party uh, run against each other to determine who will represent the party in the generals. So in November, when the Democrats go against the Republicans, if I retain all of the seats that we have and pick up at least one, the Democrats will once again have a majority. The next step after that is that my colleagues decide who the leader is. And of course, it is my hope that having been the leader for the past, uh, I've been the leader since, since uh, 2012, so the past five years, that I will be uh, allowed the honor of being the majority leader. And again, this is historic because I'm the first woman leader in the history of the New York State Legislature. There's been no woman, neither a Republican or Democrat, Assembly or Senate, that's ever been elected by their colleagues to lead a conference, which I've, you know, had the opportunity, and now I'll be the majority leader. Should that work out? Which, 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 kind of uh, leads into the next question. There is a, a good chance 
that Kavanaugh may be confirmed as Supreme Court judge within a week or so, maybe perhaps less than, than, than a week. Not confirmed, but nominated for Supreme Court judge. But uh, uh, there's been so much rancor over the last few days about uh, a, a bias towards women. Uh, so this is going to be a two-part question. Do you think that the backlash to that bias might help you then get that position in government? And if Kavanaugh becomes a Supreme Court justice, how will you legislate in favor of women when you're basically dealing with an opposite force. Right. Well, we sort of are dealing with an opposite force, unfortunately, as far as I'm concerned, because I think the tone of the uh, president and uh, some of the policies that have come down uh, have shown a real uh, difference uh, between what I think many people that I represent believed uh, America uh, and the American dream looked like and what uh, you know, apparently the president and his supporters believe. And I think we've seen such a good deal of uh, anti-women, uh, anti-immigrant, and you know, Muslim uh, bans and, and separating children from their parents and just, you know, a disdain for so much of what we as Americans believe this country was built on. We all know that it was a, a very myopic focus at first, but the diligence of so many people, the blood, the sweat, the tears, the lives of so many people that have expanded you know, what America means to include everyone and to have that respect for everyone is, uh, to me, lacking. So it has always been that way. Kavanaugh, uh, again, and I think it's important that your viewers note that I'm a New York state senator. I'm not a U.S. senator, so I will not have a vote as far as uh, Brett Kavanaugh or any of the Supreme Court people but some are of concerned. But some of his decisions will, will, will impact Absolutely. Him all over. Absolutely, which is why, you know, it's important to me that, you know, we do take uh, the majority because the states, and I think people started looking at state government, particularly after the, the elections of, of the, on a federal level, because the, that's a four-year process. But the states can do things that sets the tones in our states. And so, you know, again, I'm hoping that my, to your first question, that, that my being elected won't be necessarily a backlash. But again, since I was elected in 2012 by my colleagues, it seems to be a progression that I was the leader in the minority. Hopefully, you know, they will elect me to be the leader in the majority. And in that capacity, as somebody who, again, has, has, has benefited from the expansion of the American dream and whose shoulders, you know, of so many giants I stand upon, I will fight for women's rights. I will fight for workers. I will fight for, for uh, you know, sensible gun laws. I will fight for voting reforms. I will fight with my colleagues for criminal justice reforms. We will, we will, we will deal in a state that actually acknowledges, uh, you know, that there is climate change and, and do, you know, the right things by our environment. There is so much to do. Okay, you, you, you touched on a point, fighting for workers. We're living in the wake of the Janus decision. Yeah. And I don't know about the other towns in Westchester, but Yonkers is a, is a, a hard union town. Right. A lot of union members. And th these unions can be impacted by and, and weakened by the Janus decision in terms of political contributions, in terms of political clout, political right. lobby, in terms of jobs. Because there's no guarantee that the city can't replace union workers with non-union workers. There's no guarantee that the city can't outsource work. So how do you how do you protect people? For, how do you how do you protect the cop, the police union, PBA? How do you protect the firemen? How do you protect CSEA? They're, we're talking thousands of people, thousands of people's lives and livelihood are at stake. Yeah. Well, you know, again, um, the 
the state legislature, I think, has a role to play. And even, as you said, with this Janus decision, you know, we tried to at least not make it easy for all of the information because what happened as soon as this Janus decision, you know, went through, uh, the people who were trying to really uh, gut the power of labor unions all of a sudden started reaching out saying, oh, you don't have to, you know, pay dues right. to these unions anymore, you know, keep your money in your pocket. And, you know, we as a state were pushing, uh, certainly uh, my Senate Democrat colleagues and I were pushing to at least make it harder for people to access you know, all the vital information, address, phone numbers, email addresses, and so on and so forth, which which they didn't, you know, they would need in order to contact all these people. But again, because of the uh, Republican control of the Senate, we were not able to do legislation that would make it harder for people who just wanted to kind of raid the union members' information to get it. The governor did wind up doing a, an executive order, which will be helpful. But I think it's important that we do the things that we can do legislatively because we realize what happens with executive order. You know, President Obama did a bunch of executive orders and President Trump came in and found ways to, to tear them up. And also the governor's going to be, well, the, well the, you never, the, you the know. rumor is that he, he's going to be running in 2020 for, for press. So which we're is, talking two years from now. Exactly. So it's so important that we come Modify, uh, you know, things that we believe are important. I mean, people don't realize here in New York on a state level, for example, that, you know, the Obamacare that we have that help that the health exchanges that have been created were not creative legislatively. Because again, my colleagues on the Republican side who dominate the Senate would not pass legislation to establish the exchanges. The exchanges were made, uh, came into existence by executive order. We don't talk about that in New York. I mean, we don't talk about the fact that our reproductive laws, for example, predate Roe v. Wade. So New York passed reproductive laws that allowed women to have abortions in 1970. Roe v. Wade took place in 1973. Our laws in New York aren't as up to date as the federal laws, which, you know, happened in 1973. To get us even to where the the federal laws are requires a vote in our house, which we've never been able to get. So there is, again, you know, you, you began this by talking about labor and I said, I think that, the, that we have to be really, really clear that unions, the labor unions, you know, really help build the middle class. And, you know, I think it behooves all of us to make sure that there is the continued strength and pathway the middle class. And when I look around Yonkers and you see how many buildings are going up and how many, how many uh, you know, new apartments and so on and so forth, you know, we have to care about who's, who's getting an opportunity to live in those places, who's getting an opportunity to build those places, and to the extent that I can help strengthen the people right here in my community uh, to live, to work, to play. That's what I'm going to do locally, and certainly that's what I'm going to try and do on a state level. And we're going to go from unions to property taxes. Yes. Which, which is, we could talk about that for sure. the next two hours, but we can't. But uh, <laughs> the, 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 the proper, um, the, the house values have lost what am I trying to say? Let me start that again. Property has lost value as a result of the tax cap, the tax, the, 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 the tax contribution cap under trust, where you can only deduct oh, $10,000. $10, now, if I'm living in Yonkers, is it going to impact me? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. If I'm living in Scarsdale right. and I have a house for yeah. $2 million, right. then it's really going to impact me. Right. It's really going to take away from my property. It's, 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 I'm not going to be able to sell my house for as much as I want to sell my house. So is there a remedy for that, or is that going to continue the way it is? Well, we're trying to work on a remedy for that. I mean, again, this thing was targeted. Uh, this this um, 
Trump tax bill was absolutely targeted from what everybody can see uh, to the states that did not vote for Trump. So, so whereas, you know, the, in the Midwest, uh, you know, southern states or whatever, they seem to have not been hurt by this Trump tax bill for us, when you cap the amount of deductibility of our, of our state and local taxes to $10,000, when, as you said, so many people in a county like Westchester in New York, you know, New York City, Long Island, are paying much more than $10,000, there is, it, it is a direct hit. And so what we tried to do in this last budget was create opportunities for people to at least make charitable, charitable deductions, yeah. right, uh, in the health area, education area, trying to figure out how we could do that. So now very recently the IRS has said that they don't like that, that they um, don't believe that that is an option for us. So it really is, I mean, we're, we're pursuing, to be continued, you know, different, different options, whether it's lawsuits or, you know, we, we, we have to find a way to protect our taxpayers from what's, you know, again, will change our way of life. I mean, it, you know, it's, 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 it's unbelievable that we have been so directly targeted. But again, you know, if we, on the state level, we will continue to try and, and find a way. But I mean, again, the, the best thing to do is to, to vote, <laughs> to vote. Well, it's an ongoing, it's, it's an ongoing <laughs> struggle. And I know we, we're, we're getting, we're getting to the, to the end. We have to wrap it up, but, uh, it, critics, critics have, s critics of your campaign have said that you spent far in excess of your opponent, Virginia Perez. Uh, you know, granted you, you've been in office much longer. You have, uh, uh, a, a political war chest that was uh, much larger than than hers, but as far as as campaign finance is concerned, uh, is it necessary to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to run a campaign? Well, unfortunately, you know it is. Yeah. We're in a very high price media market. You know, uh, you have to get your word out. You know, my I I represent over three hundred thousand people. Uh, I represent uh, part of Yonkers, uh, Greenberg, you know, certainly all, all the river towns, uh, Scarsdale, White Plains, New Rochelle. I have a big constituency. So for people to be made aware of what it is that not only, you know, you've been doing, but, but the fact that you actually have an opponent, you really do have to, to spend money. Uh, and, you know, I, I, let's be clear, you know, I believe in accountability and in transparency. I don't know if my opponent has actually filed anything to, to talk about whether or not, uh, you know, where her money came from and where it was spent. I mean, I know I do my filings and people can look. And, and the reality is, is that you have resources because people believe in your message and they believe in what you've done. And I'm very proud that not only do I have a lot of contributors, I have a lot of low dollar contributors. I, I've got contributors in every part of the spectrum because of the work that I've done and the work that people believe I will continue to do. So I don't apologize for having uh, resources. I certainly don't apologize for spending them to let people know that I had a challenge. And obviously, um, you know, uh, the other the other reality is is that I have colleagues across the state who outspent their opponents and they and they had not been reelected. So the reality is is that the dollars and the reelection don't necessarily coincide. You can spend millions of dollars and still lose. You can spend a little bit of money and win as uh, Alessandria Ocasio-Cortez did. So there is a, re you know, the fact is that people judge you by your record and I have a proud record. And I think the fact that, that you know, again, over 80% of my constituents in every single locality that I represent uh, gave me a resounding victory, you know, it says a lot to me, I'm humbled, I'm happy, and I'm ready to roll up my sleeves and go back to work. And on that, we're going to wrap it up. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening, folks, to Yonkers 
Voice Central with State Senator Andrew Stewart Cousins. Stay tuned to Yonkers Voice Central for more great videos. Keep watching. <laughs>